The isolated Japanese shogunate is a place of near complete homogeneity, with an immense peasant population and a completely feudal society ruled by the Japanese emperor in name, but the shogun in reality. In Victoria 3, Japan is a hibernating beast of a nation, which, if guided correctly, can easily outpace the European and American powers. There are a healthy number of resources on the archipelago, albeit not enough to feed a healthy Japan, which will push any player into imperialism eventually. That's where Japan excels as a high-population, core nation-state, with avenues for exploitation available. In reality, Japan's imperial ambitions allowed them to take Korea and Manchuria after defeating an inflexible Qing dynasty, but they would face difficulties being accepted by the international community as a true great power. It wasn't until the First Russo-Japanese War where Japan defeated the Western power of Russia that an American president, Theodore Roosevelt, negotiated a favorable peace deal for the Japanese Empire. Although it's just barely beyond the scope of Victoria III, Japan's actions in North China in the 1930s would trigger much of the events that led to World War II, cementing Japan as an important piece of the Victorian century. The Japanese Empire in Victoria III can, genuinely, go any direction it wants, given its homogeneous, high-population territory with ample resources. It can remain an isolated and prospering agrarian society, it can be an imperializing terror upon East and Southeast Asia, or it can become the exploited colony of another Western power. Whatever you choose, I'll explain to you here how to play Japan in a somewhat historical manner. I'll be restoring the Emperor and bringing about a modernized, industrialized, and most importantly of all, militarized Japan with a few wacky turns in the last bits of the game. Taking the peaceful and traditional shogunate into the modern era will take some work, and some shifting of the demographics to make happen. First off, I'm going to put work into researching the technology needed for railways. Railways will be important for mass industrialization. Also, I'm going to destroy every barracks that's not in the capital because I fully intend to stoke the flames of civil war, which is a great way to fix the shogunate. In theory, this will open the country up to the dangers of a European invasion, but luckily the AI is too passive to ever really attack me, unless I stay vulnerable for many years. That will not be the case. One major advantage of the shogunate and its Sakoku law is the massive authority you'll have. I'm going to use it to put road maintenance in every state, which will let me build faster and increase infrastructure. I'll add other decrees as I see fit. I'm going to put the shogunate out of the government just for a second to trigger the honorable restoration journal entry, but I'm not planning to exclude them just yet. I just want the journal entry activated. For my first industry, I'm going to get a solid collection of lumber mills going. I need wood for construction and for basically my entire supply chain. Until we can get out of traditionalism, construction will be pretty slow on account of a pretty small budget, but we'll do what we can. I chose to get to around 36 construction points to start the game, but you can try being a little riskier or conservative as you see fit. Since I have traditionalism, I can use the investment pool on farms and plantations, so in order to make up the debt those logging camps put on me, I'm going to make some cotton. Cotton makes cloth, which I can use for my construction sectors too. While normally I tend to keep taxes pretty low, I'm going to just jack up taxes massively and focus on building. Generally speaking, huge taxes to create buildings that create jobs will, in the long term, be worth the depression of wealth in the population, since the wages those new buildings generate will far outweigh the income of reduced taxes. I'm also going to create a bunch of rice farms, since they're extremely profitable and will benefit my pops immensely. The hike in taxes can, somewhat, be balanced out by the influx of grain supply, hopefully. It was in October of 1840 that I got extremely lucky. I got a movement for homesteading from the opposition, and this was exactly what I needed. To be fair, you can still attempt to pass homesteading by putting the rural folk in government, but getting the political movement makes it much easier, and it's also critical for our strategy to fulfill the honorable restoration. Remember when we removed all the barracks in the country? The only states in your country that can never join civil wars are your capital or unincorporated states. In my case, all my states are incorporated, so the capital is the only place that cannot rebel. Other states may or may not rebel, but since only my capital has any barracks, I should be far ahead of the opposition just by default. Anyway, I'm going to try passing homesteading and just wait for the civil war. That radicalism is quite high, and it's guaranteed the war will happen quite soon. This is because the Shogun has over 50% of the nation's clout. After the farm's finished, I'm going to make some tool workshops in my capital so I can switch my lumber camps over to using tools. Japan doesn't have a ton of wood available, so I'll have to make up for that lack with better technology. More importantly, higher level production methods employ capitalists instead of shopkeepers, so I'll start generating some industrialist clout and a large investment pool thanks to that. Remember that in Victoria 3, your demographics are almost completely crafted by the occupations your citizens take up. More capitalists and engineers means more industrialists, which we'll be needing if we want to send Japan into a proper reform. The Civil War began in September with a surprisingly small number of states going against me. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know why it was so small. When I saw the preview of seceding states, it looked like almost every state would leave. Even if they did, I should still have had the upper hand anyway. I put one general on every front, but then when the war actually broke out, the generals just decided to be in other spots for some reason. One of my fronts, the one right by my capital, ended up empty, and my capital was immediately occupied. This was, obviously, concerning, but I didn't give up and just shuffled my generals around until everything was correct. 
Shortly, the war was turned around and the shogunate rebels' capital was occupied. Although Kyoto was still occupied for the entire war, the pace at which my exhaustion accrued was much slower than the rebels, and for that reason the war ended in October of 1842. I formed a new government composed of the rural folk and Buddhist monks, and after passing a couple days, the armor restoration was complete. I chose to favor the industrialists, and with that we are now in a position to shoot Japan into the modern era. I got homesteading just a few months later in 1843, and actually wanted to switch to state religion, since I was able to switch over to Shintoism. I felt better about using state religion. It just wouldn't feel right to have a Buddhist state religion as Japan. My tools were done around this time, and next up I worked with some government bureaucracy, dyes, ports, and finally iron. I want iron so I can make rough iron tools. I also want to make some coal, and then steel, followed by motors. I obviously don't need any of that right now, but in the very near future, railways will be coming, and that's when everything changes. After passing religious schools in 1845, I got another lucky break. My landowner leader was a protectionist, and although his clout was pretty low because of the recent civil war, it will certainly ease the transition to interventionism. If you want to increase your chances as a protectionist, keep on exiling the leader of the landowners until you get the ideology you want. You can even save scum this process, although I did not save scum in this case, I just got lucky. The faster you get interventionism, the faster you can start using your investment pool to really get your country off the ground. I put up a ton of universities in Edo because I want to generate a group of academics that can give the intelligentsia some clout. They aren't all that important for my run, but for your run they could be very important. I say that because I'm going to roleplay a little here as Japan and go for a Shinto ethnostate imperial Japan that discriminates against literally everyone. If you're going for the meta, you'll want multiculturalism as soon as possible. Accepting more cultures is always better for an empire since more accepted pops means more workers migrating to you, better wages for pops to spend on consumer goods, and less turmoil from radicals due to discrimination. The intelligentsia tend to get humanist or anarchist leaders more often than other interest groups, although it is possible to get others, and you'll want to keep exiling intelligentsia members to get a humanitarian. Keep in mind, of course, that humanitarians cannot appear until you research feminism, so if you want to rush multiculturalism, rush feminism. Alternatively, anarchists also approve of multiculturalism, and for that reason, you might alternatively seek to rush anarchism. Anarchists can appear for the intelligentsia or the rural folk. Both can appear for the trade unions, but getting the trade unions any clout is difficult without first inventing voting and getting your literacy up, so I'd recommend aiming for the rural folk or intelligentsia. Okay, that's enough about the more optimal route. To summarize, optimal is multicultural. Fun Japanese roleplay is ethnostate. I got interventionism in 1848. It took a little while, but by now, I've also got some steel mills up and my motor industries are coming, ready to ramp up the GDP. As part of our work to modernize Japan, we'll have to complete these restoration journal entries. I'll be starting by ending Sakoku Law, which requires us to open the country up to trade. Using my protectionist landowner from before, I can go straight to protectionism. In my honest opinion, I'd actually rather be on isolationism since the extra authority from it is usually completely worth it. The AI almost never produces enough goods, nor do they generate enough demand to make trade worthwhile. I've covered the issue with that in my series as America from many patches ago, and in upcoming patches this may change, but as of August 2023, in Victoria 3 the AI is not competent enough to create the demand for goods such that an export economy can be viable. Instead, your economy should always be catered to the needs of your own population. The ever upward spiraling consumer economy is the best way to generate a high GDP and a high standard of living, and that means creating goods that your pops purchase, which increases their wealth. With higher wealth, standard of living goes up, and that raises the average standard of living in a state. When states get higher average standards of living, they raise wages. Wealthier pops also buy more things, which increases the profits for consumer goods. This cycle repeats, allowing things like textile mills and farms to infinitely gain profit. Let's back up a little bit though, as that's for the future. In November of 1848, I was able to put down my first set of railways across the country, which allowed me to build massive industries to employ all my peasants. Looking around the world a little bit to pass the time, we've got Prussia taking most of Austria proper from Austria, and Britain puppeting Morocco. In America, we've got a free Texas and a free States of America, which is always funny to see. The Yankees up north have banned slavery, while the United States have kept their legacy slavery in. Mexico, in this situation, is prospering quite nicely, as the hamstring Americans haven't been able to put them down. In 1850, I got protectionism in, and the railways are almost done. Next up, I'll be passing dedicated police just because I prefer it to local police. With my healthy budget and prospering economy, I'm going to switch over to iron construction methods so I can double my construction points. For now, I have an iron shortage, but I'll rebalance the supply chain soon. The railways must be completed first. While I've got the Meiji, or in this case, Ningpo, restoration journal available, we'll occasionally get events having to do with Europeans and Japan. I'm pretty much always going to use the options in these events that give us benefits for obligations since the AI will never use the obligations on us. They're just not motivated enough to make such plays. 1852, I obtained the status of major power which I started the game with, lost when I got rid of the barracks, and now have re-obtained by increasing my GDP. Since I've got all the laws I want at this point, I've got just one thing I'm focusing on, the GDP. We're going to do that with a consumer economy since our population is quite high. 
Textile industries will be critical for our economy, as we can convert a combination of cotton, dyes, and silk to create highly profitable clothing industries. The money these textiles will generate can basically drive the entire government budget, while also creating more capitalists with more money that can help influence our clout percentages. There's only really one more law I want changed, and that's my tax law. I want to go straight to proportional taxation so I can implement a dividend tax. Dividend taxes are levied on the profits of your industries directly, so making super profitable textile industries will contribute to the budget in two ways. First, the capitalists running it will invest in the investment pool, and second, I can directly collect taxes on their profits from the outset. Unfortunately, I need egalitarianism for that tax law, and I have mostly just been researching production technology, so this might be a while. While I'm waiting, it's 1856, and I may as well pass out my professional army as my industries scale up. I'll need armies eventually, and peasant levies just aren't as good as a proper standing army. In 1861, the samurai were removed from their positions of power to be replaced by more traditional armed forces, and my GDP was climbing, hitting 35 million. In 1863, I properly ended Sakoku as I opened the borders. All I had left now to finish the Empress Restoration was industrialized Japan, which just requires me to get some urbanization going. My budget is kind of in the dumps because I'm building a bunch of bureaucracy, both for my institutions and for tax. These bureaucracies did give the urbanization I needed, and now I've succeeded in restoring the Japanese Emperor in 1865. The Empire begins here. I've got plans to take over most of continental Asia, but first I'll need a much stronger budget. I've upped taxes a bit, but to really fix things I'll have to update my tax laws. I got lucky with the proportional taxation movement pretty much right after reaching the tech I needed, so passing it will be very hard. Hey, check it out. Austria stole Quebec. Is he done, Habsburg? Anyway, November of 1866, we got our new tax laws, and now the government budget is looking beautiful. We're going to build up just a little more consumer economy, and I'm also going to change to cultural exclusion, but only to make going to ethnic state easier, before using my claims on Korea. I'm spamming out barracks now so I can get a great army going, alongside some naval bases. The bases will take some time to employ, so that'll be our last roadblock before crossing the seas. Before invading Korea though, we're going to sack Russia for Alaska. I want Alaska for the gold and wood there, as well as the opportunity to get recognition. Conquering land in Korea and China will be very infamy expensive, and for that reason I want recognition. China was allied to Russia, so I'll have to fight them too, but it won't be too tough. If I can get one good landing on them, I can get war operations from them, and I also want a free Korea, so I'll go for a landing in Beijing. Landing on Alaska is easy since there's no garrison there. Landing in Beijing is a bit tougher, because China joined the Russian market somehow, which they somehow do every game where China is relevant to me. They actually have guns and cannons. Because Qing was bankrupt though, presumably from paying for those Russian arms, they were willing to surrender without me even landing in Beijing. I chose to end the war before my enemies capitulated by just not taking the Sakhalin claim revoke war goal. I wanted to do that to ensure Russia wouldn't take it, but I can always just take it first, since Russia seems slow to colonize Sakhalin and Hokkaido. Anyway, I've got Alaska now, as the first new prefecture of the Japanese Empire. Next up is Korea, who have no one to keep them safe. I added war goals for all the claims I could, but unfortunately they backed down, which meant I just grabbed the state of Yang Ho. If I had made the other claims primary war goals, I wouldn't have been able to fit all of them, so I chose to take the risk that Korea would back down. Sadly, my gamble didn't pay off, but oh well, I've got a foothold at least in the continent now. My next law of expansion was something of a Ring of Fire Empire. I took Alaska, maybe I could work my way down the west coast of the Americas and rule the Pacific Ocean. I made a play to puppet Peru Bolivia, who had several allies in South America. I was a little worried about my chances, but getting the gold in South America would be good for my budget. Despite us having a truce, the AI is allowed to break basic game rules and join the war anyway. In case you didn't know, the player may not join against countries with whom they have a truce, but the AI is allowed to despite that restriction. Sorry, it always upsets me when the AI doesn't play by the same rules. I've added some war goals, including liberating Kamchatka. I just want Russia out of my zone of influence. I'm puppeting Chile, alongside war operations from all three of my major opponents. I sent some troops into Kamchatka, and they did fine for a while, but my main goal was to get the Russian armies in Siberia, while I sent secret ships off to St. Petersburg. I occupied the Russian capital, and enemy troops took their time arriving to defend their homes. The war kind of hit a standstill around 1879, with war support being at zero for both sides, but neither one's capital being held. My goal now is to defeat Russia first before going after the South Americans, just so I don't have to worry about any backdoor naval invasions. Russia capitulated in 1880, releasing Kamchatka and paying me my rightful dues. Invading Peru Bolivia was very difficult, and I failed to get any landings there. Instead, I focused on Chile, since they were more vulnerable. I passed to technocracy as the war dragged on for three more years, and my GDP hit 90 million. The economy, even in war, is chugging along, but I do want the war to end. With Chile puppeted and my desire to continue this war gone, I signed a white peace in August of 1883 and decided to focus back on Korea. Russia, once again, broke the rules and joined the war. That's fine though, since I can beat both of them pretty easily. The war was relatively uneventful as I naval invaded Seoul and won the war in 1884, finally controlling all of Korea. Russia attacked my friend Kamchaka, who I couldn't support because of my truce with Russia. Sorry, I'm so salty about this. If Russia can intervene on literally every war I have, why can't I intervene? So stupid. 
I'm intending to make them try to cut protectorate, and Russia invading them is not exactly conducive to my ambitions since they're going to be stealing land from someone I consider a friend. But oh well, I'll just hang out with my troops and watch as Russia takes outer Manchuria. Whatever, it's time to invade China, and Russia will of course support them against me despite our truce. I'll be conquering all of Manchuria. Oh, and by the way, the United States joined the British market. Nice. Britain reclaiming her colonies like my previous video. Checked it out, by the way. The war against China and Russia was quite simple, as I invaded Beijing and outer Manchuria. Both opponents surrendered in 1889, and my GDP is now sitting at 132 million. I'm the number 3 great power, and I'm feeling pretty good. The purpose of Manchuria is its wood and iron for the most part. Its usefulness to Japan is a launching point into further conquest in China, but more importantly is that sweet, sweet lumber. There's about as much wood in just Manchuria as all of Japan. The Republic of Germany formed, minus Hanover and Schleswig-Holstein, as well as Scandinavia. This is a very interesting Europe, although I as Japan have a higher GDP than all of Europe. I'm only slightly behind Qing, but their GDP is just peasants, so we'll surpass it in due time. By 1891, my budget is in the six figures, my GDP is growing, and I'm beginning the electricity economy of Japan, which will make me a huge set of services. I popped Kamchatka in 1892, completing my control of the Bering Strait, and I guess I've got Chile, so our little ring of fire empires sort of coming together, but there isn't really much I want from the rest of the American Pacific coast, so I probably will leave it there for the Americas. Instead, I went after Siam, which has some opium and some dyes which I could use. So I am back down, becoming my puppet, and I immediately went to puppet the old tributary of Luang Prabang. I've got a little taste of empire, but my image for Japan is yet to come. There is much to build, even though I've already reached the highest GDP and almost number one great power by this point, just off of a well-structured economy. In 1895, the Japanese emperor sponsored the construction of immense universities across the entire Japanese archipelago for one purpose, to understand Japanese racial superiority. Building off of the work of Europeans claiming Aryan ancestry and racial supremacy based on their ancestry, Japanese scholars worked to establish the Japanese people as the greatest of all Asia. Efforts to colonize Sakhalin and move Japanese people into both Korea and Manchuria to further Japanese control in those regions began as research came out about the Japanese imperative to bring civilization to the backwards Koreans and Manchurians. For the time being, both of them were accepted in the larger Japanese world. This new research led to a push in government for the erosion of rights for non-Japanese people. Kamchatka was annexed in 1898, just as the ethnostate law was entering its final steps in the Japanese palace. The technocracy of academics and scholars in the massive University of the Archipelago assembled with their papers, theories, ideas, and policies to set up new stratifications for society. Where once Japan was divided between its rigid social structure and Confucian social order, the new Shinto nationalism of Japan led to the development of a Yamato social order with ethnic Japanese on the top and everyone else on the very bottom. There are no middle classes, as even mixed Japanese people are seen as abominations of the national Japanese pride. While on an expedition to Baluchistan, the ethnostate law passed and Japan entered a new era at the turn of the century. In 1901, Japan hit 300 million GDP, and the conquest of Afghanistan was underway. The Japanese had heard from British merchants of how the Chinese would do anything for opium, and from local Baluchi villagers it was told that Afghanistan hid the largest opium preserves in the world, with even larger opium farms in India stuck under British protection. The Japanese Empire can't quite stand up to the British yet, but soon it will. Speaking of the British Empire, they faced a Republican uprising in 1907, which threatened to weaken them significantly, while the Japanese built up their forces to show the Europeans that they were equals. Ultimately, to prove Japanese superiority, there were two large cultures that had to be rebuked, the Chinese and the white Europeans. The Chinese had already been subjugated by the Russians ages ago, but to demonstrate the superiority, Japan would eventually have to take China away from them. China, because of their humiliating defeats, constant bankruptcy, had fallen to minor power status, but to puppet them in one play would immediately completely isolate Japan from any diplomacy in the world. That time will come. For now, Japan will instead supplant the colonial power of Portugal as the ruler of the Congo. I'm going to invade Lisbon and take Angola. Germany decided to protect Portugal, but the AI isn't smart enough to protect its land in Africa, and for that reason, I won the war in 1909, choosing to allow Germany to ban slavery in Siam, just because I don't really want slavery there anyway. I took Angola mainly for its rubber, even though Southeast Asia also has rubber. There's just a ton of it in Angola and the Congo. I annexed Siam in 1912 while enacting command economy. Given that Japan is an enlightened monarchy composed of the most racially superior people of humanity, a centralized economy run by the government is of course the best idea. Command economy passed in 1913, and with that, this run is now entirely unstoppable, as if it weren't already. I've got a 2 million pound budget surplus, and even though command economy has slightly shrunk my GDP, it's completely worth it for how much I can build now. It was at this point I decided I was ready to become a full-on pariah and puppet Ching. It's only 142 infamy, which is actually lower than I expected. Thankfully, Qing just backed down, which means the Chinese did indeed understand their vast inferiority to the Yamato people. Having Qing as a puppet means I've got a massive population of discriminated pops just waiting to be annexed into the empire, but that'll take time. Even more so with command economy, it can be difficult to take that many unemployed and low quality businesses into the economy without breaking it. 
One thing to note about a command economy is that it is powerful, but fragile, and can fall apart if it's not balanced well. If you annex some several hundred million pops and all their businesses into the economy, and they're operating at a loss, you'll be in huge trouble. Since UA had gotten their freedom at some point and become a Russian subject, I attacked them, looking to annex them directly into my empire for their dyes and farmland down there. Think of it like a much larger treaty port into my own sort of Qing. As part of the war, I made the interesting choice to force regime change on Russia. This would spell their doom, as from here on they'll likely never have a legitimate government again. They turn into a military dictatorship run by the landowner's intelligentsia somehow. This will result in quite some civil wars and bankruptcy for them in the future. Yep, there it is in 1915. That's quite the aristocratic revolt. Good luck, Russia. In 1917, I puppeted Persia and put down some separatists in Afghanistan. I've got 720 million GDP now, which honestly isn't even all that good for how powerful I am, but at this point I'm undefeatable. It was 1919 that I decided to annex Qing, but one thing I'll say is that this decision ultimately screwed my nation because of the command economy. It's so difficult to take on this many businesses and manage them so that they're profitable. As well, paying for welfare for the literal tens of millions of unemployed pops will be painful, and paying for the bureaucracy to get better taxation going in these states is immensely expensive, alongside the wages for those bureaucrats. In 1920, Qing was annexed, and I've got almost 700 million people to employ, and just under 6,000 construction points with which to make them businesses. Unfortunately, the immense number of Chinese radicals I've got now means I can't build things in the region very efficiently. It would have been much better to have kept cultural exclusion and just let the Han migrate into Japan so they could be workers in states that can support them. It would be a slow gain of population to fill in factories over time that wouldn't throw my economy out of whack, while I could still make goods for the Han in China since they're in my market. As cool as it is to expand the empire territorially, annexing China was the biggest mistake in this run. With China put in their place, it's time to put the Europeans in their place. I'm going to invade Britain and take India from them. India is the jewel of the British crown, and having it removed will seal the deal for all the Europeans who respect Britain's hegemony across most of the world. It's always difficult to elevate hundreds of millions of pops into a higher standard of living, but I will try. The Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, a term familiar to Hearts of Iron 4 players, was basically Japanese supremacist propaganda to try and convince Japan's conquest of their inferiority and incentive to cooperate with Japanese authorities. For my prosperity sphere, I'm going to try and bring as many pops as I can out of poverty, since at this point, my radical count is absolutely insane and it's too late in the game to really fix it before it's all over. I'm starting to pass multiculturalism, so I just want to see if I'll maybe reduce the radicals. I can't build anything in China basically because it'll take forever, but by rotating violent suppression decrees as I build, I can get buildings done eventually. I don't really have the will to manage these decrees consistently while there are less than two decades left in the game. In 1921, I started to play to humiliate and regime change Russia again because I want to cut their prestige down more. If I can get them to a minor power level, I can puppet them and use them as a buffer in the West against Europe. In truth, I just wanted sweet revenge against Russia for all the annoyances they put up during my early game. I'll be changing the government, humiliating them, taking their money, and taking St. Petersburg just to show my dominance. Much to my great pleasure, Russia backed down, and I had marked all my war goals as primary goals, so I got everything I wanted without a war. Next, I attacked Britain, as I said I would before. I'm going to grab BC and the Yukon off in Canada to further my control of the Pacific. And I'm going to transfer the British Raj. At the same time as my diplomatic play, Britain had another civil war over a Republican movement, which is perfect for me. Invading the home counties was easy, as the British were distracted by their own issues. I was putting down some separatists in Southeast Asia, which was mostly just a waste of time, as they had no chance to win. Britain lost their civil war to their communist rebellion, and then that rebellion immediately capitulated to me, giving me control of the British Raj and forcing them to give up Ireland. Due to the nature of the British Raj of the Prince of States, I don't control India completely, but this is good enough. The major parts of India are taken, although I'd like to grab Punjab as well. I immediately made a play to annex the Raj, which is, much like China, a bad idea. I'm probably going to crash my economy more than it already is crashing after taking in China. But the reason I don't care much is that we're almost at the end of the game now. But if I were to try and make this country work better, I'd get rid of almost all the bureaucracies in China since I don't collect taxes there anyway, and the cost of their bureaucrats and paper is basically completely tanking my budget. With the Raj annexed, I'm almost at a billion population, which is pretty cool, although I'll never be able to implement all of them. I'm more or less just doing a victory lap, conquering everything I can. I directly conquered Burma, got multiculturalism at some point, I forgot when, and put down more and more separatists while a trade union strike began. I got a feminist at some point and started putting women in the workplace around 1927, while I was attacking Britain to take even more land in India. I also declared bankruptcy just to see if I can still win even with a bankrupt nation, but it turns out that most of the world has been bankrupting itself across Europe. This is likely because of all the radicals everywhere ruining their tax intake. If I zoom into anywhere in Europe, the red fists are everywhere, and I'm suffering from the same issue with all my infamy. One of the effects of infamy that often goes overlooked is the increase in radicals from conquest. Basically, any land I conquer would just be 100% radicalized and useless to me. This is a world of immense communism, with Britain, France, and Germany all being communist, although Russia isn't yet. Even the two Americas are communist. 
In 1929, the mass of communist rebellions in Russia came up and I went back to Ethnostate because of a cool revolution event I didn't know existed. In July, while I was passing to a council republic to join on the communism train, apparently with a revolution, there's an event that just instantly passes the law, which is awesome. For multiculturalism straight back to Ethnostate for Japan. Shortly after the Soviet Union appeared in all its red glory, but I'll be bringing the Soviets into my sphere in the near future, since I consider them under my influence. In 1930, I puppeted the Soviets, and if you're wondering why these nations capitulate to me so quickly, it's because they're all bankrupt, even though I am too. Everyone is bankrupt in this world. When a nation is bankrupt, they are willing to capitulate extremely quickly compared to normal. Right after, I became a council republic. This is where I'll end the run. I've got almost 2 billion GDP in 1934, and my population is almost at 1 billion. I tried conquering a few more places to get just up to a billion population, but I couldn't quite hit it. I puppeted Scandinavia just to really extend my control across to Europe, but obviously by 1935, nothing matters anymore. I started annexing the Soviets, hoping they'd back down before the end of the game to push me to 1 billion pops, but they didn't back down, and thus the game ended. I did complete this campaign, and it was lots of fun. By the end, I was just conquering for conquest's sake, but to be honest, as Japan, you can basically become number one great power just off the back of your native population. But if you take Korea and Manchuria too, we will have tons of pops to work with and lots of resources. I recommend finding a better source of coal though, which you can find in Shaanxi. Conquering at least some bits of North China can really create a massive empire, and by monitoring your conquests such that you don't take too much, you can even maintain diplomatic ties. With how Victory 3 is currently though, it's pretty much always better to just slam your infamy to 100 and take everything. Just be careful about how many pops you annex in one moment. This is the Japanese prosperity sphere, and it is indeed pretty prosperous, at least for the Japanese. Don't be fooled by the average standard of living. The people in Japan are living great lives, while the rest of the empire is suffering with poverty to provide for their Japanese overlords. The brief period of multiculturalism was basically a random misstep that was quickly reversed. You can consider this video a guide to Japan, although the new beta patch coming soon might invalidate some of this. Most of the principles in this video still apply no matter the patch, so hopefully that'll help you. Thank you for your time.